reached me for Christ, what reached me for the gospel, it was one solitary high school boy who refused to take no for an answer. In the Western culture, in the Western civilization, Christians basically hit one shot and done. You have to understand in our world, for a Muslim to come to faith in Jesus Christ, to leave Islam, you lose your culture, family, job, home, sometimes your life. In the average Muslim, it takes seven years to come to faith in Jesus. For me, it was, it was any number of years. But one boy, from the moment he started talking to me, would not leave me alone. It didn't matter how many times I said no. I, I, he invited me to events. He invited me to uh, special all-night things. He, he invited me to concerts. I said no, 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 no. I did not want contact with the uh, kafurim, with the infidel. Finally, my senior year in high school, to show him, I walked into this little church. So one solitary boy, one tiny little storefront church, one pastor who had maybe a sixth grade elementary school education. It was always the small, the isolated, the anonymous. And if you think about it, Christianity marches on the shoulders of anonymous people who have invested their lives. I mean, any person watching, if you do a, a, a detailed analysis of your life, most of the people who radically affected you were people who the world doesn't know their names. Their names aren't on the spines of books or on the sides of buildings. They're, they're the anonymous. And it was an anonymous boy. It was an anonymous church. It was an anonymous pastor. And it was one little people who loved me to the cross. And it, this is important because everything I had ever learned about Christianity, I had learned from my imam, from my uh, masjid, from my mosque, from my leadership. Every single one of them. And, and, and every caricature that I held was based on caricatures that other people had held. The meaner I was to them, or the more sarcastic I was, or caustic I was, the nicer they were to me. I sat by myself, boom, they all come sit around me. Uh, I'm churlish, and they just smile. I was amazed at the ability of the Christian to love me in spite of me. And this is important because it's unconditional. And when I finally afterwards asked them, why are you so nice to him? Why were you so... Well, I said, that's the way Jesus loved us. Romans 5.8, for God commanded his love toward us that while we were still sinners, while we were still at war with him, while we still hated him, Christ died for us, the godly for the ungodly. That is a, a radical concept for somebody like me. He takes me to the pastor. The young man does. And the pastor says, what do you think about Jesus? And I said, in Isa, his name is Isa in Islam. We respect Isa. As a matter of fact, we named the 19th uh, surah of the Quran after his mother, Surah Miriam. He said, you can't respect Jesus. It's something that I tell Muslims when they say, no, we hold him in high reverence and high respect. You cannot respect Jesus. Because Jesus declared himself to be God. Isa ab Messiah. Jesus said he was Messiah. And more than just Messiah to the Jew, but he came to die for the world. If Jesus said these things, he is not qualified to be a prophet in Islam. The people who claim to be God, and there's thousands of them throughout history that have claimed to be God, they are either diluted, or in the case of Jesus, he actually is who he says he is. But in either case, some man walking down the streets drinking alcohol who's talking to himself who thinks he's God does not deserve my respect. To summarize it, he said, you either revere him as God or reject him as a fraud, but you don't have the option of just respecting him. That door opened. He asked me this question. He said, Islam teaches that Jesus wasn't crucified. Yes, Surah 4, verse 157, Esau was not crucified, but somebody else in his place. He said, why would Jesus be indicted of a crime worthy of crucifixion to begin with? Was it trumped up charges? No. Was it blasphemy? Yes. What's blasphemy? In other words, he opened the door to me about crucifixion. That when Jesus died, his death had some meaning, some hope. In every debate that I've done, 
and every time I've debated Muslim, Sunni, Sufi, Alawite, uh, Shia, every debate I've ever done, this question always comes up from the Muslim. What does one man's death have to do with me? But you see, in Islam, there is a measure of this. If I die to further Islam, I am helping my children, I am helping um, my family, I am helping future generations. So my death does, in fact, resonate throughout Islam. The question I ask them is, what would Jesus' death resonate for you? In other words, if Jesus shed his blood, I don't have to. Jesus' blood shed, Jesus' death offers me the one thing that Islam cannot answer, and that is the screaming need for my assurance, the screaming need for forgiveness. And so Jesus Christ, according to the Bible, dies on the cross, buried three days, resurrects, ascends into heaven's temple, presents his blood, and then he sits down. And so then I will ask the Muslim, why would, why would, Isa, why would Jesus sit down? Is he tired? And he sat down because he was done. Finished. Atonement has been offered. If I may say it this way, Jesus strapped himself to a cross so that I wouldn't have to strap a bomb to myself. I lasted four days in that church. After so many years of struggling, I lasted four days. On the fourth day, I came forward. Um, I told the pastor, Isa bin Allah, Jesus is the Son of God. I want to be saved. I want to be born again. Now, that's all preacher talk for simply saying that I wanted Jesus to forgive me of my sins. I accepted his sacrifice in my life. I accepted his bloodshed for me. I repented of my sin, turned my life over to him. He is not just a messenger. He is Messiah. And he's not just uh, the lover of my soul. He is now the Lord of my life. And in so doing, I learned that I live much more righteously when I'm not trying to earn his favor. I do so because I've already been receiving his favor. I do so because I love him like a child to his father. I do things to love him, not to earn his love. Up until the moment I became a Christian, everything I did was based on fear of the scales. Discovering that Jesus Christ forgiving me, cleansing me, saving me, had done this for me, I'm now confused. So do I not do good works? Often Muslims will point to hypocrites. And I, and I tell Christians, I say, you know, the worst Christian they know is the best Christian they understand. Because they always see the hypocrites. And I said, does that mean that I can go do what I want? That I can go live the way I want? Because now I don't have to earn his favor? And it's the exact opposite. I slowly had to learn that I do what I do, and I am what I am, and I read what I read, say what I say, not to be accepted, but because I am accepted. This change in my life, diet, this change of life, I pray more now than I did before I was a Muslim, when I was a Muslim, because I don't have to pray. God tells me I have access to the throne at any moment. Uh, it was said of, of one evangelist that he was not long without prayer, but not long in prayer. I don't have to go on for hours to prove something. I pray when I have a need. I pray that moment. I pray that second. I don't have to do wudu. I don't have to do cleansing. I don't have to put myself in a certain position or else he won't hear me. He hears. He loves. And because God is so intimate, the call for me to live a right life is now the love that a child has for his father. I want his acceptance, I know I have his love. Let me, let me, if I may add one little point here. What is interesting is the liberation for so many Muslims who come to faith in Jesus, leave Islam, become a Christian, is that we don't know how to respond to unconditional love that way. We cry easily. We are so free to love him back. One of the things that, that catches my attention in Christianity is the idea of loving God unconditionally and without fear. Um, they call it worship. It's devotion. It's, it's passionate. It's driven. This is foreign concept to us. Because when we speak of Allah, 
in every debate, in every discussion, I have never met one Muslim, not one, who believes that the Allah of the Quran and Jehovah, intimate Adonai God of the Bible, are the same God. Allah is not Father. The Quran, Surah 112, the most important chapter of Quran, says that Allah does not beget nor is He begotten. Allah does not have children. Uh, to use the big terminology that people use, Allah is transcendent. That is, He is judge, He's creator, He's on the throne, He's watching, He's separate. But Christianity teaches more than just that. The Bible presents that Jesus, uh, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, are not just judge and creator, but intimate, indwelling. There is no such thing for a Muslim to have a personal, intimate, uh, indwelt relationship with Allah. I found out that when I got saved, that we come boldly before the throne of grace to obtain mercy in a time of need. No, you're not. The Bible says that you're a temple of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit indwells you, that I am inhabited by God. In that, He comes and lives in my life. This is profound to someone who has never heard this. We did things in Islam for the first almost 20 years of my life. We did things out of fear, out of obedience. Uh, when you pray, you pray because Allah will do what Allah will do, but you ask out of obedience. As a Christian, I ask because He is Father. It's one of those degrees of separation that separate Christianity from any other world religion. We're not religious, we're saved. But that's more than just a little bumper sticker. Christianity offers a relationship with the Creator as Father. No other world system has an intimacy with Creator as, as the Father and Child intimacy. In Christianity, and only in Christianity, does God offer the sacrifice for man. Around the world people throw virgins in volcanoes, we, we sacrifice blood on rocks uh, because we are trying to appease the wrath of God. But Jesus on the cross took the wrath of God against sin. As I referenced, the most difficult thing to understand as a Muslim is the concept of the atonement. Why would Jesus die for me? But the twin difficulty is the issue of grace. Because that's the answer to the question of why. I love the fact that in my world and in my culture we ask questions. We want to know the reason. I love the fact that we are passionate and we debate. That we want to know answers. We won't accept rote, uh, silly little euphemisms that we use. But they ask, why would Jesus die? Answer, because grace compels him. And I define to Muslims this way, mercy and grace are twins. The Quran says Allah is merciful, the beneficent. But in Islam, mercy simply means that he does not kill you when he can. It is a sign of his sovereignty. In Christianity it's different, and in the Bible it's different. Mercy is when I, when I don't receive what I should get. But grace is when I receive that which I don't deserve. Mercy, I don't get what I do deserve. Grace, I receive that which I don't deserve. Which means grace God does for me even though I have done nothing to merit it, nothing to earn it. Christ died for me while I still didn't want it. And if Christ's death is in that measure, that's grace and that's unconditional. I always challenge the Muslim, you say that Allah is love. Show me one verse in the Quran, show me one, where Allah loves those who hate Him. Allah loves unconditionally. The Quran is full of times where it says that Allah loves those who repent, Allah loves those who forgive, Allah loves those who act right. But show me where Allah loves those who don't want that love. That's the definition of unconditional love. It's the love of a father for his children. It's Christ dying for us. It's the godly for the ungodly. It's the just for the unjust. The promise is the cross was unfair but it was still just. It was just because God's wrath does have to be appeased. And the Muslim is right. God's anger towards sin. But if Jesus dies, and Jesus dies in our stead, then it, it, the crucifixion was just because it paid the payment. But it was mercy because he didn't owe the debt. It wasn't his bill to pay. And it was grace because then He offers that forgiveness to me, unconditionally. 
often I will hear a Muslim say, well, I, I, have to, I have to think of this, I have to get better before I'm ready for this. No, that's like taking a bath before a shower. The cleansing that takes place in my life is done to me, just like his death was done for me. If I may use the words, salvation was done for me, sanctification is done for me. Jesus buying my sin and Jesus making me good. It's done to me. It's done for me. It is done so that I now do differently, act differently, but I do so because I love him. I ask the fathers in Islam all the time, do you want your children to obey or to love you? And they think about it. Well, they must obey. Well, why do they obey? Because they love me. Do you want them to fear you or love you? I don't want them to fear me if that means that they're scared that I will always hit them. Because, you know, what's universal is the love for children. Well, tell me, does Islam offer a love of Allah and obedience because you love Him? That's all Christianity is. Legalism and Christianity do not walk hand in hand. Holiness does. I define it this way. I do now what I do because I love him. I don't do it because I'm trying to be a legalist. A person who loves God and tries to walk in holiness does so because we want to look more like Jesus. A legalist always wants you to look more like them. They define whatever Christianity means by whatever they are. I just want to be more like him. Will I ever achieve it? Absolutely not. Does that mean that the journey is uh, negated? Of course not. It means that I do what I do because God isn't looking for my perfection. He just wants to see that I'm in the right direction, that I'm going in the right path. Not that I'm doing it to earn His favor. The straight path was a crooked cross. And, and I tell my Muslims, those that even may hate me, that I can't hate them anymore. Jesus said the measure of Christianity is a love for those who hate us. The Muslim is not the enemy. He is the one for whom Christ died. It's my job to love you even if you don't love me. It's hard, but it is exactly what Jesus did for us. One of the major objections that Muslim apologists, that Muslim philosophers and scholars will present was the Trinity. They cannot possibly fathom how God can be Father, Son, and Holy Spirit at the same moment. Who is Jesus talking to? Himself? Does that make him schizophrenic? And I always use very natural, simple illustrations. There's nothing that we can find that absolutely dictates truth on the Trinity. We know that the Bible teaches the Trinity. We know God is triune. But how do we in our limited, finite minds understand uh, the infinite? But I do use simple things that draw us to it. I will usually pause and say, why does that cause you any trouble? Space is a trinity. And remember, in our world, space is something that's very important. And I will point to some point in the air, and I will say, you see this point at the end of my fingernail? That is depth and height and width simultaneously. Why does that cause you a problem? I will point to my watch, and I will say, time is trinity. This moment that we're talking is both past, present, and future simultaneously. Why does that cause you a problem? Because I cannot understand it in the physical sense. I just explained two physical things. Yes, but this is a trick. It's not a trick. It's three dimensions. Now, am I saying God's three-dimensional? I'm saying that God is infinitely greater than our illustrations. But it isn't hard to fathom it if you understand that there's so many other analogies that seem to point us to the fact the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one substance, three persons, triune. Because if He's not, then the Bible's wrong. Because if the Bible's wrong, it references God the Father as God, God the Son as God, and God the Spirit as God. If that's wrong, the rest of it's made up too. They will ask, well, who, who then was Jesus talking to? I said, to the Father. But he said he did not come to do his will, but the Father's will. I said, while he was on the earth, yes. Well, he said he did not know when he would return in the Bible. That's right. He knows now. 
Well, then why on earth did he not know? Because when Jesus was on the earth, he didn't lay aside his God part. He laid aside his divine prerogatives. Jesus walked from Jerusalem to Jericho. Could he have blinked his eyes and flown? Of course. Could he have walked through walls? Of course. Could he have just transcended time and space? And, and Of course. He chose by his divine will to walk. Why? His identity with humanity. And part of his identity with humanity as a perfect human, as well as perfect God, was that he chose to self-limit his divine prerogatives. There were times where it leaked out at the Mount of Transfiguration. But he chose, while on earth, to lay aside his divine will, and thus he becomes the work of the Father. Who is Jesus talking to? Well, even in the Quran, Surah 3 teaches that Jesus spoke from the cradle, that he said, I am a messenger of Allah. The Quran teaches the virgin birth, the pure birth. The Quran teaches that Jesus formed a clay bird. The Quran teaches that Jesus spoke as an infant, as a newborn. The Quran teaches that Jesus did many clear signs. Who did that for him? Well, they will say, Allah. Why? Well, because he is a messenger. Why? Because Allah will do what he wants. There you go. If God is God, he's beyond anything you can ask. It brings us to the point of understanding that even in Islam, though they believe they are so rational, there are things that they don't have answers to. That doesn't mean they don't believe him. I'm simply showing that the Trinity is, is rational, cogent, understandable, but it's infinite. The liberation that comes from salvation is the freedom of knowing that I fear God out of reverence, out of love, but I am free from judgment. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, that he loves me warts and all. The fear of being perfect when you first get married, you're afraid your wife will see what you look like when you wake up. You fear that she's going to see that you don't always smile when you're supposed to. You're going to fear that she's going to see a glimpse of your anger. And then she sees those things. And you're amazed that she doesn't leave. God loves me, and he already knows those things. God loves us. He already knows all of our faults. God loves you. And he already knows your doubt, your fear, your angst, your terror. And yet he still loves you. The only thing that could compel that is the heart of God. For my Christian friends, I pray for their patience. We have a tendency to give up too quickly. I have been waiting now for 24 years for the salvation of the rest of my family. I can't stop praying. When I pray for them, I wish I could pray, Lord, save them and, and you know, do it against their will, but he, he doesn't work that way. So what I pray is for God to put people in their path where they, the person will not only tell them the gospel, but be aware of the opportunity to share mercy and grace, the atonement, and salvation, in, in such a way that it's understandable. A lot of us hide behind big words. I mean, it's the world I live in as a theologian or as a, as a scholar. I don't, I don't like using those words because I would much rather be understandable than to be uh, highly honored. So I pray that God puts people in their lives that will tell them the gospel so clearly that they understand the relief that comes from not having to live by scales. Instead of living by the scales, I live by the cross. Both look like a balance. But in this way, I have to do on the cross. On the cross, he did for you.